Hello, welcome to the EKG Guy, and welcome to the EKG of the Week. I hope you're having a wonderful week, and I'm glad you could join us. This week's case is an 84-year-old male with a history of hypertension that presents with a fever. His EKG is shown here. Before we get started, let's review the approach we've been using to interpret EKGs. So notice that we have the patient's clinical presentation and then the EKG below. On the right side of the screen, we have a list that we'll go through before making our interpretation. First, there is the regularity of the rhythm, that is, are we dealing with a regular or irregular rhythm? And if it's irregular, is it regularly irregular or irregularly irregular? Next, we have the heart rate. Then we'll look at the rhythm's origin. That is, where is the rhythm actually starting from within the heart? Then we have to look and find the ventricular or QRS axis, which could help us with our differential diagnosis. Then there's the atrial, atrial ventricular or AV, and then intraventricular or IV conduction, looking at if the conduction is normal or not. Then we'll look at the waveforms, which could include all the waves, the segments, and the intervals. And lastly, anything else, meaning, is there anything else that we've missed or still need to mention? After that, we'll use all this information we've gathered to make a final interpretation of the EKG. Now, I want you to pause the video and take a few minutes to try to go through it yourself. When you're ready, start the video, and we'll go through it together. Okay, so our 84-year-old male with a history of hypertension presents with a fever in this EKG. So let's take a look at it. First off, what is the regularity of this rhythm? Well, on first impression of the EKG, you probably notice that the rhythm appears irregular. Not only irregular, but it's irregularly irregular. Okay, so let's look at this here. Why is that? Why is it irregularly irregular? Well, here's our Let's look at our R to R intervals, okay? When we look at regularity, we're looking for regular um, intervals, okay? So if we use this R wave to the next one, okay, in this interval, you'll notice that it is not the same as the one that follows, okay? So already we see an irregular rhythm, okay? And the, the um, interval that follows that from this R wave to the next one is also not the same as those that precede it, okay? The same thing, the one that follows it, okay? And if you go through this, you'll see that there is no, there's no regularity to the rhythm whatsoever, okay? Now, if you recall, sinus arrhythmia is a rhythm that does actually have some regularity uh, to it. So in that case, we call that a regularly irregular rhythm, okay? In this case, we have an irregularly irregular rhythm, okay? So what did you get for the heart rate? Well, because we have an irregular rhythm, we can get an estimate of the heart rate by adding up the complexes across the EKG and then multiplying that number by 6 because the whole EKG represents 10 seconds, okay? So let's do that. So what we're saying here is you should know before even getting started that the standard EKG from beginning to the end represents 10 seconds, okay? And if you multiply that 10 seconds times 6, that gives you 60 seconds, okay? And that 60 seconds equals 1 minute. So we can get the beats per minute by counting the number of complexes going across, okay, then multiplying it by 6. So let's try that, okay? So we have 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, okay? So 12 going across, we have 12 times 6, which is 72 beats per minute, okay? So that's a good approximate, and actually the EKG machine gave the same rate, 72 beats per minute, okay? So you can see how this can give us a really good estimate most of the time, okay? In this case, it was actually exactly the same as the EKG machine. Now to the rhythm origin. Well, we have narrow QRS complexes here, so it must be supraventricular in origin. However, you can't really make out any P waves, so it's certainly not sinus rhythm. So it must be coming somewhere from within the atria or AB junction. Function, okay, so if you look here, you can clearly see that there's no defined uh, P waves. Okay, here's lead one, lead two. Okay, no P waves that are clearly made out before our QRS complexes. Okay, so we don't have sinus rhythm. Okay, and then in AVR, we don't see any inverted P waves there that would suggest sinus rhythm. Okay. So again, uh, we don't have sinus rhythm here because we don't have uh, any P waves. So our origin is either from the atria or AV junction. 
okay, somewhere in that region, but not ventricular because our QRS complexes appear normal, and we'll look at that shortly. So how about our ventricular or QRS axis? Well, you should have gotten a leftward QRS axis. The actual value here was negative 25 degrees, okay? So our ventricular axis was negative 25 degrees. So how do we find uh, the electrical axis, okay? So in this case, we're looking at ventricular axis, which is the same as the QRS axis, which means we look at the QRS complexes, okay? Now, normal ventricular axis lies in this region, okay, where this arrow is pointing, which is between negative 30 degrees and about positive 105, okay, or 110, around that region. So all this region here is considered normal, okay? Now, if you recall, lead 1 sits here, the positive end, at 0 degrees. This is where lead AVF sits, at positive 90 degrees, okay? And those will be our first main ones that we'll look at, okay? Now, you also have to note that our normal axis region was here, okay? This would be right axis deviation in this region here. Over here would be left axis deviation, okay? And then we also have this extreme uh, axis deviation, which is sometimes known as no man's land, okay? So extreme axis deviation in this quadrant here, okay? So let's look at lead one. Well, lead one, which is here, you can see is mostly positive upright complexes, okay? So lead one heads towards the positive end of it. Then if we look at lead AVF, we are negative, okay? Mostly negative complexes there. So remember, this is the positive end of AVF, meaning we're going away from it, okay? So that puts us somewhere in this region here. Now notice we said that physiologic left axis deviation is considered this region here, which is still normal, but pathological left axis deviation is more in this region, beyond negative 30 degrees, okay? So because we only know that our axis is somewhere in this region, okay, we need to look at another lead. And that other lead we're going to look at is lead 2. Lead 2 sits here, okay? I'll put it here. This is positive 60 degrees where it sits at, okay? And because lead 2 sits there, it is actually the perpendicular plane of that goes across, which goes through that negative 30 degrees, meaning that if it is mostly positive, okay, it will be on this end and in the more normal axis. But if it is negative in uh, lead 2, it will put us in this region here, which is that pathological region, okay? Well, in fact, the uh, if you look at lead 2, it actually looks like our QRS complexes are isoelectric, meaning that the positive portion and the negative portion are pretty much the same. And that would mean that our axis lies somewhere right along this region where negative 30 degrees is, okay? And we said that the axis here was negative 25 degrees, okay? So still in our within our normal range, but still in that leftward axis uh, portion, okay? So hopefully that makes sense, okay? So we're looking at lead one, lead AVF, and then we add lead two in because we have to de determine if we're in that pathological leftward axis uh, shift or if it's more in that normal axis shift. Now you could have noted that the axis here was near negative 30 degrees degrees by noticing that lead 2 is nearly isoelectric, as we said. Therefore, the ventricular or QRS axis would lie perpendicular to lead 2, which would put us near negative 30 degrees. Okay, so hopefully you uh, that makes sense. Now let's move on to atrial conduction. Well, here we said we can't make out any P waves, and the P waves represent atrial depolarization, so we have no clear atrial conduction here. Okay, so atrial conduction, we will just put an X there because we can't make out any clear P waves. How about atrial ventricular or AV conduction? Well, again, no clear P waves, so no clear PR interval. We don't have a PR segment we can make out, and therefore there's no good evidence of AV conduction here. So again, we're just getting through this chart quite quickly, okay? So no atrial, no AV conduction. Next, how about atrioventricular conduction or IV conduction, okay? Here we look at the duration of the QRS complexes. Remember, our QRS complexes uh, represent ventricular depolarization, okay? Now the normal QRS duration is between 70 and 110 milliseconds, which is about two to three small boxes. Well, we can see here that we have narrow QRS complexes within normal limits. In fact, the QRS duration here was 88 milliseconds. So again, that is within normal limits, so we have normal IV conduction or intraventricular conduction, so we'll just write normal here, okay? And it was actually 88 milliseconds, which is in our normal range, okay? All right, so how about the waveforms? Well, the P waves we said are clearly uh, aren't, aren't here, they're absent, so uh, how about the abnormal Q waves, okay? 
So how about those that we can see in the inferior leads 3 and AVF, as well as possibly in lead V1? Well, first off, let's how do we define these pathological Q waves? That's something we should go over. So pathological Q waves are defined as Q waves that are at least 30 milliseconds wide and at least one millimeter deep and at least two anatomically contiguous leads. Okay, or you could have QoS complexes in two anatomically contiguous leads. Okay, now in leads V2 and V3, it's a little different. They're defined by having Q waves that are at least 20 milliseconds wide or having these QS complexes. Okay, so again, when we talk about contiguous leads that in their anatomically contiguous, meaning the inferior leads, which are 2, 3 AVF, so if we draw our complex. Our uh, quadrant system here, this is lead two, this is lead three in AVF, okay? So these are contiguous to each other, and so are these ones here, okay? And if we looked at uh, one in AVL, these would be contiguous to each other. So we're saying that if we see these types of Q waves in those leads, that's what uh, we mean by these anatomically contiguous leads, okay? So in this case, we're saying that we see these abnormal Q waves in lead three in lead AVF, okay? And you can clearly see these are contiguous to each other. Now we said in these leads outside of V2 and V3, okay, that we need them to be at least 30 milliseconds wide, okay? So if we, this is our Q wave, this is, imagine we had a P wave here, well in this case we don't, so imagine this is a Q wave, okay, and we're talking about the width of it, so the width has to be at least 30 milliseconds, and we said the depth of it has to be at least one millimeter, okay? So that's defined as pathological. And again, it has to be in at least two of these anatomically contiguous leads, okay? So in that case, we actually do see that in leads uh, three and AVF, okay? Let me just erase this here so you can see. So lead three, okay? You can see these deep uh, QS complexes here, all right? In these leads and it's hard to make that out but they are at least uh, 30 milliseconds wide so remember 40 milliseconds is one small box okay so it's a little less than that and we see that here and then in AVF okay you can actually see them here as well okay hard to make them out but uh, if you trust me there is actually um, those are actually pathological and they go beyond one millimeter deep all right. Now notice that in lead two, which is also an inferior lead, we don't have pathological Q waves because again, there's initial R wave and then an S wave. Okay. Remember, we defined our R wave as the first uh, positive deflection after a P wave. Okay, of the QRS complex, whereas the S wave is the first negative deflection after the R wave. Okay, so again, we have these pathological Q waves in uh, the inferior leads three and AVF, not in lead two, and then we also mentioned possibly those uh, in V1. We don't have the other right-sided leads, so it's we can say possibly maybe there's some right ventricular involvement in the past. We just don't have the right-sided leads to confirm that. And actually in V2, we do see a small R wave uh, and our S wave, so those are not contiguous, okay? Remember in V2 and V3, what's different from the other leads is that they have to be at least 20 milliseconds. So instead of 30 milliseconds, 20 milliseconds wide, or QS complexes. Remember, QS complexes are simply what we showed here. So if you imagine this, okay, this is a QS complex. Why is that? Because there's no R wave. So if you just have a downward deflection and then goes upward as our QRS complex, that's defined and that's what we call a QS complex, okay? So that's that would be pathological in those uh, two contiguous leads, all right? So uh, because we have these pathological Q waves in 3 and AVF, there's possible prior inferior uh, infarction in this patient. Now, T waves are present. They're asymmetric and appear normal. In this case, the PR segment and interval we can't make out without the P waves being present. The overall QRS interval and the amplitude appear within normal limits. The ST segment does not appear significantly elevated or depressed anywhere throughout the EKG. And the QT interval appears within normal limits. So overall, it's an abnormal Q waves that we're seeing in these in these three in AVF that stick out the most. Okay, And we'll write that here. So let me erase this so we have room or when we talk about the next section. So this is abnormal Q waves, and we're seeing it in three, right? And the other lead was AVF, okay? And that we said was possible prior uh, inferior MI, okay? So let me just say, it. we'll put old MI, okay? <laughs> All right, so we saw the abnormal Q waves. Is there anything else that we're missing here? Well, did you notice that we do have poor R wave progression in the precordial leads, okay? So 
remember, pre when we talk about R wave progression, we're going from V1 to V5, and we should see that the R waves should increase in amplitude, okay? So remember, our R waves, we can't really make it out here in V1, but we have a small R wave, okay? This would be another R wave. Again, it's appearing small, another small R wave in V4. Here's our R wave in V5. And we're saying that it should increase, but it should be much larger than that in V5 in most normal patients, okay? So there may be an old, old uh, MI that was going on in this patient uh, that's just not reported, okay? So there is poor R wave progression. So we'll write that here, poor R wave progression. Okay, and then the other thing is this transitional zone, okay, and the transitional zone in the precordial leads appears to occur in leads V5 and V6 or between those leads. The transitional zone is simply the precordial lead where the QRS transitions from being mostly negative to being mostly positive with the actual transition area to be where the QRS complex is isoelectric. So that would be the actual transitional zone. Normal, normally we have the transitional zone occurring between leads V3 and V4. If it occurs earlier than V3, we call this a counterclockwise rotation or early transition and if it occurs after lead v4 we call this a clockwise or a uh, late transition okay so clockwise rotation or late transition if it occurs uh, after um, v4 okay so because we have this one occurring after V3, okay? This is technically considered a clockwise or late transition in this case, okay? So if you look here, our, we're saying that we're going from mostly positive to mostly negative, okay? So if you look at V5, you can see clearly that we are still mostly negative compared to that positive small uh, portion in that R wave. And then once we get from V5 to V6, we can see that we're mostly more positive. So the transition occurs somewhere between here, between V5 and V6. And because it's happening after V4, we call this a uh, late transition, okay? Or clockwise rotation, okay? All right, so that's a clockwise or late transition. Now, one thing to keep in mind with this R wave progression in transitional zone is that they're highly dependent on lead placement. So be aware of that, okay? This is not a perfect science, so be aware that there is um, a lot of, uh, it's highly dependent on where the leads are placed. Okay, so what's our final interpretation here? Well, we have an irregularly irregular rhythm occurring at a normal rate with no clear or well-defined P waves along with a normal interventricular conduction and abnormal Q waves that we said in leads three and AVF. So this is a case of atrial fibrillation with evidence of a prior inferior MI. Okay, so let's write that. So AFib, because we have that irregularly irregular rhythm. And notice that we're at a normal rate, so we don't have rapid ventricular response, right? Our rate here was 72, so within normal limits. And then we said also that there is that uh, possible or evidence of that prior uh, inferior uh, MI that we saw in leads uh, three and AVF with those pathological Q waves. Okay, usually you'll see that at the end uh, of an infarction and over time. So in conclusion, our 84 year old male with a history of hypertension that presents with a fever has an EKG that shows atrial fibrillation in evidence of a prior inferior infarction. Well, that's the end of this week's EKG of the week. I hope you learned something. Please don't forget to like this video and leave a comment below if you like what we're doing. In fact, many of you have asked how you could help us out. Really, the best way would be to simply subscribe and share this resource with your friends. You get free access to more than 300 videos. There's also a community of over 125,000 of us like-minded individuals on Facebook. So stop over and join the EKG Guys Facebook community. If you need a crash course on EKGs, we launched our new EKG course recently. Check the link below if you're interested. The original cost is around $150, I believe, and I made it less than $20 for a limited time. I may be biased, but after reading nearly every EKG textbook on the market, I think this is by far the best EKG series to take you from a beginner to a physician level in no time. Anyways, check it out for yourself. I think you'll really enjoy it. And of course, check out our brand new website, ekg.md, the premier EKG resource for medical professionals where you'll find more lessons and practice. That is www.ekg.md. Last but certainly not least, leave your feedback because it's incredibly helpful and your kind words are always an encouragement on those long days. So let us know how we're doing. Thank you again for your support. It is truly appreciated. We are the largest, fastest growing EKG resource in the world.